From Washington, Diplomacy and Global Affairs, in Conversations with Nicholas Krull. On the program today, we look at training and professional education for diplomats with the director of the Foreign Service Institute, Nancy McIldowney. Our people are implementing our president's foreign policy, and they need the very best skills, the latest information, the best assets they can have to carry that out. And so that's our job. That's what we at the Foreign Service Institute need to be held accountable for doing. Michael Downey on the difficulties of teaching diplomacy and preparing the Foreign Service for the rapidly changing challenges it faces overseas. Stay tuned. Support for Conversations with Nicholas Krolov comes from these sponsors and viewers like you. To contribute, visit nicholaskrolov.com. Thank you for joining us. Ambassador Nancy Michael Downey is here. She joined the Foreign Service in 1986 and has been Deputy Chief of Mission in Turkey and Azerbaijan and Ambassador to Bulgaria. Most recently, she was Vice President and then President of National Defense University. And in February 2013, she became Director of the Foreign Service Institute. I'm pleased to have her on this program. Welcome. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Nick. The Foreign Service Institute is known, I find, in various parts of the federal government just because you have courses for not only State Department mm -hmm. employees, but government employees from various departments. What is it when you tell people what you do? In one sentence, how do you explain your job? Uh, thanks very much for that question. It's a great one. One sentence is going to be a bit of a challenge, but I think the best way to talk about the Foreign Service Institute is the platform. We set our diplomats, both Foreign Service officers and civil servants, up for success. The military has a great term that they use, strategic enabler. And that's how we see FSI, as we call it. We get some of the most talented people our country has to offer, and we bring them to FSI, and we train them in everything from computer skills to consular regulation, from language all across the board to leadership. And we do that because we want to set them up for the incredibly important work that they have to do. These men and women that go around the world to represent our country, they're real patriots. They take great risk and they make great sacrifice, but they do it because they're committed to protecting America and advancing our interests around the world. So to, to explain what a diplomat is mm -hmm. and does in the 21st century, I find it's not that easy. And I've written a whole book about mm -hmm. it. But um, what's interesting, I find, and, and very um, curious, in fact, about the way that the American Foreign Service operates in 2013 is the huge variety of tasks, challenges, countries and regions you have to serve around the world. It used to be that many people would s stick to the same region for most of their career. Now that's changing. In fact, if you want to get promoted, you are encouraged to go out and, and uh, work and serve in various regions. To me, one of the most difficult things to, for the average person to wrap their mind around is, how do you expect any of, any of us, any person, to be a jack of all trades, which is essentially what a foreign service officer often has to do, going from one a public diplomacy job to an economic job to political to management to consular. How do you set up for success, as you said, someone in that circumstance? Mm -hmm. It's uh, a, a complex set of issues that our diplomats have to deal with, but there are some commonalities. And that's a, an important part of telling our story. As I have traveled around America, I've found many people in this country really want to understand what our diplomats do as they represent us around the world. And there's great support for that, even if there's not a lot of understanding about the complexities, whether it's negotiating peace treaties or advocating for business deals. Uh, but they are quite interested to learn about our work. And many times, the State Department isn't great about explaining the work that we do because we don't have a boastful culture. Oftentimes, we are more focused on getting the work done than singing the praises of what we have done. 
when we look ahead to the challenges that are going to be facing our country and the skill sets that our people will need, we focus on first advocacy to make sure that people are working to represent American interests, but also analysis and strategy, understanding what's really going on around the world and developing a strategy to make sure that we have the right kind of outcome that protects both American interests but also those of our friends and allies. So our platform at FSI, our strategic enabler, is designed to make sure that people have the full range that they need. They need to understand issues like global health and global energy, human trafficking. But they also have to have culture, history, mastery of foreign languages, and most importantly, they need to be leaders. They need to look to our role in the world and help us lead our way forward. So that's what we're trying to do. They have to respond quickly to change and changing circumstances, but they all know that what they are about is America, keeping America safe, taking our interests forward. And so that's really at the core of American diplomacy. So we have here the latest catalog yes. of the Foreign Service Institute with hundreds of courses mm -hmm. in it that are offered in the classroom yes. across the Potomac. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Arlington, Virginia, and you have also online distance mm -hmm. learning courses. As, as I said, it's not only State Department employees, but, but the federal employees mm -hmm. from various departments and agencies. So, you know, when I looked at this, and, and as part of the research for my book uh, last year, um, I was allowed, in fact, to attend various uh, classes at FSI. Here is, now, there is no question that everybody I've talked to, the hundreds of people I've talked to for my book, I think most of them would agree that what FSI offers today is better than what it was five, ten years ago. But the complaints I still hear is what we are taught in the classroom doesn't have much to do with the real world. That we understand that each country is different. We understand that each supervisor or boss is different and has different requirements, how to write a cable, how to do this and that. But the, the things that they're taught in the classroom either by people on staff, meaning other FSOs, or outside contractors, is just either outdated or just doesn't apply when people get to post and have to do that in real life. How do you overcome that? One of the ways you overcome that is by listening to the input that people give us. And one of the first things we did at FSI when I was privileged to take over this job from my very talented predecessor, Dr. Ruth Whiteside, who I know you worked with when you were a student there. And Dr. Whiteside did a wonderful job. Well, I wasn't job. a student. I was auditing. You, auditing, was, I, auditing. That's, that's we didn't right. charge you tuition not, or give you collect no, grades. I haven't worked for the government, no. I was <laughs> there was doing okay, research for excellent. my book. Right. Um, but one of the things that we did shortly after I took over was to send out a message, a cable, to every one of our embassies and our consular posts and asked them for their input, for their criticism, for their suggestions, because the crux of what we're doing is to make sure that we are relevant, that we have immediacy to the challenges that people are facing. We are a corporate training facility, and we want to make sure that everything we offer our people makes them better at their jobs, because we know the stakes. Our people are implementing our president's foreign policy. And they need the very best skills, the latest information, the best assets they can have to carry that out. And so that's our job. That's what we at the Foreign Service Institute need to be held accountable for doing. And so we've sought input from our embassies. We're seeking input from our colleagues throughout the department. Um, I, for example, attend meetings on a regular basis with Secretary Kerry so that we know what's going on, what are the issues that he's looking at today and tomorrow. Right. When I think back about um, my experience with these hundreds of people in the Foreign Service I interviewed for my book, another theme that came through was the fact that many of them are sent to do jobs they've never done before, perhaps the jobs that nobody in the Foreign Service has ever done before, because we've had in the last decade all these requirements and new tasks and new frontiers to conquer and 
uh, and all that. There are, after all, there are 275 US missions around the world. Mm -hmm. And they're sent there without language. I have an example in my book. Someone mm -hmm. was sent to the Middle East without speaking Arabic. Um, having been a political officer, he was sent to do some to manage a budget of, that became over two million dollars. He never managed a budget in his life before. He, I know there are management classes at FSI. I guess he didn't have time to take any of those. But there are still people. As much as things have improved since that person was in that position, mm -hmm. uh, I still hear from people, including DCMs, these deputy chief of missions, including ambassadors, tell me FSI is sending me first and second tour officers who just don't know what an embassy does. Doesn't you know? He is in the consul section because he has no idea what the econ section does and how it's different from the, com the commercial section. You've been ambassador, mm -hmm. and you know that. Mm -hmm. So are things getting better? Are you determined to make things better? I'm absolutely determined to make things as best as they possibly can be. But a, a word of explanation. There are always anomalous cases, and I think you've met with a few individuals in the past who went out without sufficient training. My sense is that that is an anomaly, and the vast majority of our officers receive very targeted and extensive training for the jobs they're going to take on. Most of our first tour officers, our entry officers, in addition to getting orientation at FSI, they also get training specific to their job, whether it's consular or management, whatever position they're working in. But they also get as mandatory training uh, a course that we call area studies that focuses on culture, history, and politics to really orient them to where they're going. And then, assuming their position is a language-designated position, they get anywhere from 26 weeks to two years of foreign language training. That's the norm for most of our people going out. And as you know, we have a two-year program for the hard and super hard languages where we, we really make sure that people have complete proficiency, mastery of a foreign language. There are many examples that we can talk about of different people from uh, public diplomacy officers in the Middle East who speak fluent Arabic. We have other officers, a woman who's serving in Japan, blogs in Japanese about her visits to 47 different farms all across the Japanese countryside. So these are people who have taken the essential tools that we've given them at FSI and then have really made maximum benefit, maximum advantage of those tools. That's what we want to have happen in every single case. And for officers have time to take mm -hmm. these classes in language, right? I mean, I don't even know, did you have time to take any Bulgarian before going to Bulgaria? Unfortunately, I didn't get much because you were time needed to yesterday. do <laughs> Bulgarian before because uh, the Senate confirmed me and it was time for me to get out there. Most of our officers are assigned to language training. And because they know in advance they're going to that yes, country. Yes, if you know in advance and if you've got the time to do it. But I also think that there has been a change in the culture inside the State Department and frankly throughout our society where people value training. They want to get it and they know that it will make them better. Right. There's always a question of time and pressure about a, a job, but by and large, people want it, and we try very hard to make sure that it's always available for them. Right, and you said a minute ago that people get extensive training. Let's just be more specific, because uh, what is extensive for you is not such for the military. Because mm -hmm. you know, in the military you train <laughs> most of the time. Uh, but also in other countries, I find, for example, that their orientation or whatever you call that first course people take is much longer than the five weeks that people get here at, at, at FSI in the so-called A100 class. Why just five weeks? It used to be 10, then it was seven, then, then it's five now. Mm -hmm. is, that, well, is it a resources issue or is it that you think people can use their time to do their own studying and self-education? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the current length of the what we call A100, which is the introductory orientation for new Foreign Service officers, is actually six weeks long. We've extended it by a week, I think, since you completed yeah. your book. But what we do, it's not so much a question of counting days and hours. It's looking at what we're trying to achieve. 
And when we first bring people into the Foreign Service, we want to talk to them about some of the basic structures, get them ready. It's an orientation rather than a detailed training. After they complete that initial course, they then go on and have much more training focused on the specific job they're going to take, the country they're going to go to. So for the average first tour officer will spend generally six to 10 months in training in Washington before going overseas. Now this is, most of that is language though, right? Oh, because the majority of So it let's is say language. six weeks A100, then mm -hmm. let's say someone is going to be a political economic officer. So the, mm -hmm. the poll econ course is what, three, four weeks, right? It's about four weeks, I think. It's about four weeks Consular now. is what, yes. five now, five six. or six weeks. Okay, mm -hmm. so that leaves most of that six month on average time you're talking about to language. For language training. There are other things we do as well. We give security training. We also give leadership training for people who are going to be first time supervisors. But what we have found is the, the lengthy training is for language. That's where you need the time to really uh, master what right. is the challenge of that foreign language. But that gets people started. Then they go overseas, they take on their first assignment, and they have people who are mentoring them there. But when you look over you the- You hope. You <laughs> hope, yes, one hopes. And, no but we also have, that. by design, every deputy chief of mission, the number two person at an embassy, is formally assigned as a mentor for all of the junior officers, the first and second tour officers there. And most of our embassies have formal programs of mentoring to help these people. But when you look over the long term about what does it take to build a diplomatic leader, our system is actually not that different from the military one. I've worked in military education, as you know. And the military, like the State Department, starts by having people focus on what their specialization is, whether they're in the Navy or the Air Force. We do that as well by putting people into the positions that represent their specialization or the, 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 the is career the term. track, which is the they, what they track. choose now before they even apply exactly. to join the Foreign Service. Exactly. And for those who don't know, there are five of them political, economic, public diplomacy, consular, and management. So, but as I said, people are now encouraged to take jobs out of cone, as it's called, right. to get promoted because you want an, someone to have the experience of serving in various regions and doing different jobs. Mm -hmm. Because in diplomacy, I find, especially in US diplomacy in, in the 21st century, you have to have people that you could send anywhere to do anything. Yes. Right? Well, part of that is because we have a global foreign policy. And we are looking at developing our leaders, diplomatic and foreign policy leaders, over a 20, 25, 30 year career span. So we want people to master the specifics of an individual job early on. But then as they grow and develop, we want them to understand the inner relationships, the complexity of diplomacy in this century and the next one, so that they will understand how the work they're doing in one country relates to what we're trying to achieve around the world. Okay. Let's, yes, would, you, would you open the catalog to any, any, any page? Any particular in, in page. Your, pick, pick a course and let's, let's tell people what the course is about. Okay. Well, don't pick and choose that much. Don't <laughs> pick and choose. Well, <laughs> actually, why don't I tell them about some courses that we've done recently? Okay. Because we've done a really, we've got some very innovative and exciting courses. Um, we have just completed a course uh, that we call informally our marketing college. And this is a new program that we have done just in the last couple of years. Our public diplomacy officers who are trying to tell America's story, explain our policy, explain the positions that we take. Probably one of the more challenging things to do in the It's Foreign a Service, very yeah. difficult thing to do. And we are benefiting from some fantastic American patriots who give their time pro bono. They donate their time. These are marketing executives who represent some of the top companies around our, our country and around the world. And they come in and they talk to our officers about how to market, how to brand, how to successfully represent, tell a story, something that you've done so successfully. Tremendously effective program. And I heard just this morning from an officer who went back to work, he happens to be serving in Taiwan, said that he found it a very powerful, very fantastic course that he had under, that he was able to experience and now put into use directly and how relevant he found it. 
We have another course that opened today that's looking at global health issues. Everything from women's issues, uh, global uh, energy and environment. We've got a lot of courses that we're uh, launching now talking about the new cutting edge issues that people uh, are facing every day on the job. So who would be taking the global health course, for example? Uh, well, we have people who work for the State Department, and they might be political officers, economic officers. So is it an elective? Be, Does uh, anyone have to do it mandatory? It's not, that is not a mandatory course. That is something that is recommended depending on the job, and people elect to do it. And as we know in the, in the State Department system, very few people have the time or the luxury of time to come but, to Washington and take those, right? Uh, that's right, although more and more people are fighting to find the time because they know how good it is for them. But this, is a, this course is also a good example because we are an interagency training facility and we've got people from a number of other agencies who are joining us for that course as well as many others. We have military officers, people from civilian agencies across the U.S. government who come on to our campus and take our courses there as well as online. I find, and please correct me if I'm wrong and if this is changing now, but there's, as, as I said, there are hundreds of courses in the catalog, and, and many of them provide very good information. I had difficulty seeing how that information applies to what people do on the ground. To how, in other words, how do you teach a, an FSO, a Foreign Service Officer, how to do his or her job on the ground once they arrive at the post, how to do it. Not background on health, global health or back, back, background on HIV AIDS. No, specifically how you do the, this and this. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, maybe you don't feel the need to teach that. Maybe you, you, you have the philosophy, we'll teach you the, the fundamentals, and then it's up to you as a, an intelligent person who's passed the very difficult foreign service mm -hmm. entrance process to figure that out. Actually, I think we do both. We do give people the framework in the same way that when you go to college and you get a degree, it's not so much about memorizing facts or figures. It's creating a conceptual basis or foundation so you know the right questions to ask. And that's certainly a large part of what we do. But we also have very tailored courses. We call them trade craft, where a political officer, let's say, who is supposed to go out and understand what's going on in a political environment to be advocating for human rights, to be trying to help reach a peace accord in a country that is, is racked by violence and discord. We do actually teach people those things in the tradecraft courses, whether it's political tradecraft, economic, consular, PD. Those are the fundamentals that we give them. And then, once they get into country, as you say, they're smart people. They've gone through an extensive competitive process. And they then have the chance to apply those skills on the ground. They have supervisors. They have mentors, people who know what they're facing. And then they are able to pull it all together and make it happen. But Diplomacy, as you've mentioned, is very complicated and getting more so. It's not something you learn overnight. Ours is a profession that is dedicated to learning. And all of us who have dedicated our lives to this profession have also committed to a lifetime of learning. Every time you go to a new country, you learn a new language, new people, new culture. That's one of the exciting things about it. But it's also one of the demands of our, of our profession, of our chosen work. Right. And finally, the ambassador course. So many people ask me yes. as I go around the country and, and the world mm -hmm. and to talk about my book, and people ask, uh, well, how much training do ambassadors get, in particular the political ambassadors, mm -hmm. political appointees? And so the answer is two weeks, right? The ambassador course is two weeks. Now, I know that they're supposed to do, and they do, what's called consultations, which most people outside don't really know what that is about. But basically, they go around and they meet with various officials at the State Department or other government agencies that have to do with the country where that person is going. Sometimes they would meet with, once they confirmed, they would meet with the ambassador of that country to Washington, right? And they do their own study and self-improvement and all that. But for the average person out there, two weeks to prepare someone who has never worked in government has never done anything in foreign policy. Maybe, let's say, they, you know, he ran a financial services company for 20 years, right? Great business person, but really doesn't know much about diplomacy. And people say two weeks is not enough. 
to prepare them to be the ambassador of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Is it enough? Well, a couple of facts that are just additional elements that I want to add. Um, since I have been at FSI, we have launched a new program for political appointee, non-career ambassadors, as we say. And we have started a new two-day program for them, which is an introduction to the State Department and an introduction to the U.S. government that lays out for them a number of things that they need to know. Although many of our political appointee colleagues do have experience in the government, they've worked elsewhere on Capitol Hill or had other positions, um, and then bring that experience to bear as they take on their ambassadorial duties. Um, but even those who haven't served in government before, they have long and distinguished careers in business, in law, in politics, and they bring to this position something that I think is really very valuable, several factors, in fact. One is the um, breadth of what they have done professionally. Most of these people are very experienced leaders, and being an ambassador is primarily about leadership. It is about inspiring and motivating other people. It's about analysis and strategy. It's that kind of leadership that is so important. And you build that over a lifetime. So in two weeks, we don't create a new, either our career ambassadors or our political appointee ambassadors, but we do shape them. We do get them started for understanding the challenges that they will face and understanding the really awesome responsibility that has been placed on their shoulders. And then they go forward and they do country-specific consultation, other studies. And then, also in the case of our political appointee ambassadors, many of them are assigned some of our most experienced officers to be their deputies, to be their deputy chief of mission. Uh, in my previous work in the State Department and in other agencies, I've worked with political appointees throughout the government, and I've found them to be very committed, very successful professionals who have made our government better. Well, not all of them, but probably most of them. They're always, as you said earlier, on another occasion, yes. there are always, I mean, they're, we, they're different people. Some are better than others, and, but that's life. In the human pos in right. population, you're always going to find a variety. But, but the vast majority of people that I've worked with, the political appointees, have done extraordinary work, very valuable work that they've given to our country and our nation. All right. Well, thank you for Great. coming. My it's pleasure. You. Thank you so much. For more about our show or to make a contribution, the address is nicholascrollett.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.